Well, now we know who cares about painting. <laughs> Only 2% of the people who go to the school like painting. The other 98% enjoy video and sound. <laughs> Clearly, that is a favor. Uh, blame the internet, why don't you? Um, back in the mid-90s, we had the misfortune of being signed to a record label called Matador Records, which was riding high on the success of bands like Pavement and Liz Fair and Cat Power and Guided by Voices. So they had a lot of extra money. They got distributed by Atlantic Records, which had more extra money, and they gave some of it to us. Uh, we were happy to accept it at the time, but probably should have asked for way more. Uh, Mecha Normal was also on Matador Records at the time, probably the only time in history that bands like Mecha Normal and Bunny Brains and Run On and Helium and so many uh, awesome people back in those days would have been signed to any kind of you know, regional distribution, global distribution at the time. So um, we then got into playing shows with Mecha Normal, and uh, this is Gene Smith and David Lester, and Mecha Normal had a side band with a, um, called Two Foot Plane, um, also awesome. If you ever go back in time on the internet, you can look all that up. But uh, we often would get booked into places that just didn't want us there. We had a show in West Hartford, Connecticut one time that was in basically the after hours bar for the penitentiary. And this is where guys who have been in, uh, you know, administrative positions with prisoners all day long just wanted to go and relax and have a beer. Did not want to hear challenging avant-garde, half-naked, hippie uh, polemics from us or from Gene. And we just struggled through it with a lot of whiskey and a lot of beer. And uh, since that time, Gene has, has decided um, that she's just kind of Give, give, give a lot of that lifestyle up. Um, some of it still fuels our lifestyle. And we've diverged only there. And my love for her is so huge and uh, massive. Just Wikipedia or something. Look her up somewhere. But this is, um, she's recently gone to be more of a painter and decided because she went to art school when she was young and it was energizing to her in her heart she was going to return to it. She's had a series of hilarious mishap jobs at Williams-Sonoma and in Pottery Barn and other administrative customer service things where you, you end up getting humiliated, like in those jobs that you do get humiliated in. And um, as we advance in our age, we decide that we're just going to do things that we really like to do. And one of those things for her recently is this extreme, immense, incredible passion for painting. And I want to present this uh, short piece that she put together for TBA right now. Thanks. Hello. My name is Tracy Shen, and uh, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I used to own an extra cafe. Uh, please put your hands together for a warm policy welcome uh, from 
David formed Method Normal in 1985 and have released six critically acclaimed albums since. Now the duo has collaborated on a book. Jean is the writer and David is the publisher. I Can Hear Me Fine examines Jean's feminist and political concerns. Here's an excerpt. My thoughts are chased by dogs, trapped in instamatic snapshots. Their eyes are red and light. I can see into their mouths. Pass the tea, pass the tea. I'm at home in the strangest places, but the sea is just pounding water, trying to get revenge. Trying to get revenge. The book is, uh, I, I was going to say about, it's not really a book that has an about. It's not dogmatic. It's not saying this is good, this is bad. I think it's very easy to uh, imitate what we already know. <laughs> This year, but communication is more important than conventional commercialism. Although Mechanormal is relatively unknown in Canada, they are internationally respected. Their lengthy live shows are passionately political, and they tour Europe for the third time this spring. It's not strange that I realize it is for other people. So, uh, for Jean and I, we've been doing this for so many years that it's just this is normal the way she sings, the way I play guitar, what we do together. And, it, and it's always a shock to other people. Like, that's weird. Because, you know, this is our life, this is normal. To do this, to be mysterious or quirky or odd, or to, you know, get attention because we're different or something, it's not a given. <laughs> So uh, 
this has now turned into what I'm doing full time after after quitting my uh, short-lived stint at Home Hardware Garden Center, where they had me lugging water around uh, in the spring, and then they wanted me to come in. This was supposed to be a part-time job. They wanted me to come in uh, seven days in a row for four hours each at five in the morning. Uh, so right at this juncture, I was I was having some success. These paintings were selling. Yeah, I was selling enough to make a living. I've got fairly low overhead, and I was making enough to pay my bills in, in selling the series, which is $100 US for uh, 11 by 14. And uh, I was selling eight or nine, sometimes up to 12, I think I sold in August. So part of the, the political action here is, is simply being able to uh, quit working, become self-employed through doing a series of uh, evocative, I hope compelling faces, portraits. Uh, I've extended the series in a few different directions. It started with the hat, and then I started doing, after a few variations of hats, I started doing no hat, and, uh, and, and it, uh, sales weren't affected. Uh, it's been a nerve-wracking <laughs> time, you know, when you hit on something that actually seems to be working. It's, it's kind of terrifying, you know, success can go wrong in so many ways. Uh, and that's been really interesting because a lot of the things we've done as mechanormal uh, have been pretty low key. We, we didn't set out to be famous, but we have maintained this great creative partnership, David Lester and I, where we're, we've been making music together for over 30 years, having made 13 albums and toured a lot, enough, I'm sure there's more to do, but it, it was never an intention to become famous or make a bunch of money. We we actually set out to change the world. That was that was why Mecca Normal was created. We wanted to address young women specifically and and encourage them to start bands with their friends, women, girls, their female friends and start addressing what was going on for them in culture, popular culture in their scene. Because at that time, in the 80s, there was really, uh, there weren't many women in bands on stage, and if they were, they were typically the bass player, and the words were not about feminism or sexism. So we started Mega Normal specifically to change that, and the, the result, was that we did, to some extent. We did change the world, and we do a classroom event called How Art and Music Can Change the World that illuminates a lot of uh, why people make political art, what their intentions are, what ours are specifically, and how Riot Girl came to exist in Olympia, Washington, um, and that we were uh, an inspiration to the co-founders of Riot Girl. Uh, so we we were uh, influential to that development, and that was that has always been something I kind of wanted to make known that it is that it is possible to have an idea. And for things to happen from that, there's there's just such an overwhelming sense that you can't do anything, and this is not the case. We have the evidence. So uh, at a certain point, when things are going really well, you're seeing some of Dan's, the ones that Dan has up there. Uh huh. Uh, so I I thought, well, he was actually the only person as far as a retail situation or a gallery 
that I wanted to contact because, because of his sort of uh, sensibility uh, around art and, and the, the store that he has in Hudson, New York, where we played and we met up with Dan many occasions to, to work together primarily in music with Buddy Briggs and Economal sharing the bill yet again on, on a number of occasions. Uh, so I, I wanted to send paintings out to the store for him to include in uh, his collection there. And now they're in Portland, which is fantastic. I wish I was in Portland to be participating. Uh, I, I did get a laptop laid on me last night, which should enable me to be Skyping. Uh, I don't know if I can get that together, so I wanted to make this specifically uh, for you and to just sort of uh, fill out from, from beginning to end uh, what's, what is a, a lifetime of making political art and, uh, and regarding that intention as, as a viable life. The, the benefits from having a, a creative partnership where, where you have accountability and support and encouragement is, is really a hell of a life to put together with one or two friends who, who maybe don't have the same skills that, that you do. But uh, in, in fact, David and I are, are very different people. He's, uh, not my romantic partner, it's a creative partnership. All these years that we have worked together on uh, book projects, writing, publishing, and, and mostly mechanormal music, but uh, he's a very fine uh, graphic illustrator, comic uh, illustrator who is working on a uh, book right now about Anna Goldman, uh, her final years in Toronto. So when that is complete, we will likely put together some sort of adaptation involving all these things, the music, his artwork, and the way that we present information, uh, some kind of adaptation to, to bring it all together, which is, is relatively new and challenging for, for us to, to use the basis of, of mechanormal and the music and, uh, and move outward from there. But this is what happens when you, when you stick with something uh, 30 years or more. So the, the sense of the paintings uh, evolving through through these uh, six or seven months since I have started and, and created uh, about 170 of them. Half of them have sold directly off my Facebook page, just my personal page, uh, to people who know me through music, but also some actual world-class art world artists, which has been kind of shocking to get some uh, feedback from people who have shown in various, you know, high-level uh, shows in major institutions. So that's been a real thrill to to feel like I'm on to something here. And now it's a matter of maintaining life in in a way to uh, you know continue painting a lot. And, and it's kind of a shock, you know. I, I before I was doing this, I was I was working on fine-tuning a couple of novels. I have one novel out with a literary agent who is submitting it to various publishers. That's been an ongoing uh, process for a couple of years now. That's a, that's a slow business. Wow, getting in and published. But this is all a total surprise to me. I, I'm a painter suddenly. I mean, it's not something completely out of the blue. My parents are both painters. I went to art school for a little bit. Uh, couldn't, couldn't hack it, man. It was just not for me. They wouldn't give me any black paint. I was supposed to be making black, 
at art school. And that was that was it for me. Make your own black. Uh, so I started a punk rock band. So I'm like a fitting response to that. I'll make I'll make my own goddamn black over here on the stage. So I I I had thought at some point that I would be a painter or a, a commercial artist, as it was called back back at that point. But uh, yeah, these have been some of the happiest times ever to to be self-employed, making art that is is put out in front of people as soon as it's dry, it goes up on Facebook, and people seem uh, happy that it's a uh, hundred dollars. People have been telling me I should put the price up. I don't want to put the price up. I like doing a lot of them, and I want to make them available at this lower, affordable sort of rate. I don't really want to be in in regular galleries. I mean, I don't know what what is really next overall. Something may happen along those lines, but it's not my ambition to be you know, incorporating sort of a middleman, the gallery, into the process. Uh, if I can do it on my own in, in this DIY sensibility, that's, that's my preference. Uh, so that is uh, also, I think, the politics behind doing, doing the art, making the paintings day by day. And, and that they are a, a mainly feminine faces. A lot of them are not gender specific. And many of them are actually uh, done from a photograph of a trans model. And that, that's also very kind of uh, interesting to, well, interesting is not a good word, but to make faces that are not specifically of women because that that is that is a strange pursuit in and of itself. It's this layering of color on on, on a woman's face, much like applying makeup or the masks or what what you know, the layers of women essentially the barriers between themselves and the the world external to them. Uh, so that is, that's all, these are all things I'm thinking about while I'm doing it. Is, is it political to be painting a, a pretty lady? How is that, how is that a viable way to, to make political art? So I, I challenge myself with, with thinking like that, and in fact recently I, I've started working on, on much larger panels, 20 by 24, and I had thought that I would simply be transferring uh, to scale the faces that I'm doing. Uh, but then I realized that if I made the faces the same size, then I would have a lot of extra uh, background which I could infuse with political notions, you know, I don't want to be having banners or, or text or whatever, but there, they could be faces in scenes that they're bearing witness. Uh, so I, I started working on that, I had, had very mixed results, but what, what did happen was because I've been watching the direct action and the uh, protests at Standing Rock, I, I did a couple of paintings, interpretations, they're fairly abstract, they do have some figures up along the top of the water protectors, and uh, I was very surprised that when I put that up on my Facebook page, it got a really great response. So that, that is something that is obviously directly political, it's, it is practically all that it is, it is very related to the title. Uh, standing rock water protectors, uh, which is something you know I've definitely done before in giving things titles that are that are undeniably political and leaving the piece to be more the piece of art itself to be more ambiguous. Uh, but uh, yeah, the process continues, and hopefully I will be 
able to uh, be myself into, into the space today. Thank you for listening.